Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, we are learning about the trial of Jesus found in Luke chapter 23. If you enjoy filling in the sermon notes as you listen, you can download them now at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 is our text today. And if you're here and you don't have a Bible, uh, just go ahead and grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1049, page 1049. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, just take one of those with you. It is our gift for you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, message us, either the service host right now or email us at calvaryaz.com. We will get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, we're continuing our uh, journey to Easter, uh, looking at different episodes in uh, the, the path to the cross and to the resurrection, uh, all the way up to Easter. And, and it just made me think, hey, in 2025, in November 2025, we're going to be going to the Holy Land again, and we're going to be visiting these places that we're talking about. So if you've ever kind of wondered, hey, uh, what's it really like to be in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed? If you want to visit the place they believe is the upper room uh, or the place, place says where they say, hey, this is where Jesus might have been crucified, raised from the dead. Uh, we would love to take you. Uh, and there's brochures available out in the foyer or at the Connection Centers. You can grab those and check it out. Uh, it is a wonderful and life-changing trip. And so as many of you as like to go, I'd love to take you, get that information. Uh, we're just going to be right there in Israel. And I know things are crazy there now. Uh, we, I just believe that, you know, in a year and a half, things will be a little more settled. Uh, and if not, we won't go. Uh, but uh, anyway, that, that's how that works, right? And, uh, and speaking of Easter, hey, I am so glad that you guys come on, on Saturday night because we don't have room on Sunday morning for you. <laughs> and... <laughs> And so I'm just delighted in that. So thank you for coming Saturday night. And we're going to add an extra Saturday service on Easter weekend. And uh, you guys, look, uh, you can just come, come to your regular service uh, if, you, if you want to. If some of you want to come early at 3.30, uh, then that's fine too. Uh, I just uh, want to, to make sure you guys know, uh, please don't come on Sunday unless you're serving. If you want to volunteer to work with kids in the nursery, we'd love to have you on Sunday morning on Easter. If you'd love to help out with security or with uh, uh, first impressions or making coffee or, you know, doing any of that kind of stuff, then yes, we would love. If you want to volunteer for the tech team, we'd love to have you on Sunday morning. Otherwise, just be just who you are. And, and come, uh, come Saturday and bring your friends with you. Hey, uh, we're looking at the trial of Jesus. So I, got, I just got to ask, have you ever suffered an injustice? Any, anyone? Any, anyone feel like they have? Yeah, Okay. Anyone ever been falsely accused of something? That's always a great feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Slandered. How about slandered? Yeah, everybody should probably raise their hands at that point. You might not have known about it, but you were slandered. Trust me. Okay. Somebody was saying stuff about you that wasn't right. And, and the thing is, uh, you know, we want to respond one way. Hopefully you respond the biblical way. But uh, the real question, you guys can talk about this over dinner, but how did God redeem that situation? Uh, and I was thinking about this, and as pastor of Calvary, uh, look, I've been falsely accused and misjudged for a lot of things. Some of them by Christians uh, who've accused me of only being concerned about numbers. I always remind them there's a book in the Bible by that name. Uh, <laughs> that I'm just motivated by money. Uh, and I thought, that's interesting because I haven't made that much. Uh, watering down the gospel, selling out to be successful, all kinds of things that were really hurtful. But uh, uh, And then I've been accused of things falsely from those in the world because of our biblical views on marriage and sexuality. I've been called homophobic, a hate-filled bigot, or unconcerned about at-risk teens. Uh, and because of our biblical convictions that men should lead families, I've been called uh, misogynistic and anti-women. Uh, and, and here's the reality. All of us will answer to God for how we live our lives. All of us. I, I mean, God is the only one who knows our motives and our intentions, and God will judge with true justice. 
Now, in the meantime, we live in a world that is filled with misjudgments and slander and injustice. Just like Jesus did. Just like Jesus did. And since we're continuing our path to Easter, today we're looking at the trial, and we're going to see up close the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of the world. Now, just to recap, if you haven't been with us every week, we started in the upper room, Jesus uh, instituting the Last Supper with his disciples, instituting what we call communion, where we, where we remember Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, and then Jesus went to the garden and he prayed uh, and, and just did that battle to just really surrender to God's plan, even though he didn't want to do it. Then he was betrayed and arrested and, of course, taken to the helm of the high priest. And Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. And that's where we pick up today in chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Uh, so now he is before Pont uh, Pontius Pilate. So it says, then the whole company of them, that's all of those who are the chief priests and the soldiers and everything, arose and brought Jesus before Pilate. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent saying, he stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. Now, the first thing I want you to see in the trial of Jesus is that Jesus confessed to being king. He confessed to being king. You have said so. Are you the king? Yes, you have said so. Uh, the Gospel of John even makes it more clear. Jesus said to Pilate, uh, John records him saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my people would have fought for me, but my kingdom is not of this world. So, this is really the only question that Jesus answers under oath. It's, you read all the accounts of the trials in the Gospels, and this is what the one that he answers because he is the king. Now, I, I just submit this to you because this is significant because a lot of people want to be pro-Jesus. A lot of people want to say, hey, Jesus is really cool, and we should learn from Jesus, and we should check out Jesus, while at the same time they reject or ignore what Jesus says. And, and that's not really consistent. So they can try to say Jesus was a great teacher, a great role model. Yay, Jesus. But um, Jesus can't just be a great teacher or a role model. Not if you listen to him. You only got two choices, right? Really. He's king or he's crazy. That's it. I mean, have you listened to the words of Jesus? Here, just walk with me through some of these. Uh, I think you've heard of this one, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, that Jesus is talking, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Jesus says, I'm the one who gives eternal life. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 10, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and my sheep know me. John 11, Jesus is talking to Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. I am the resurrection and the life. And then the disciples were questioning Jesus and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, it doesn't get much more clear than that. That's just in the Gospel of John before you even go anyplace else. So you can believe Jesus is king or you have to logically assume that he's just plain nuts because he's under oath and he says, I'm the king. Jesus confessed to being the king. And can I just tell you that my declaration is that Jesus is my king. Amen. So have you confessed Jesus as king? your king. I'm glad some of you have. So here's, here's what that looks like. Do you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins? It's very personal. Do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and have you made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life? 
Okay, see, if you've done that, then Jesus is your king. You've confessed him or declared him to be your king, your Lord, your savior, the one who gives eternal life. Now, if you haven't done that, if in the chorus of yeses, you remain silent, either because you're not sure that he's really the king or you just haven't committed yourself to him, you haven't surrendered to him, you haven't given yourself to him, can I just encourage you to do that like right now? Just stop, stop listening to me and start talking to God and just say, God, I, I wanna follow Jesus. I, I wanna give you my life. I want you to change me. I want you to save me. He will do it right here and right now. If you're not ready to do that, but you wanna to talk to someone about that, then see us immediately after the service. Our prayer team's gonna be here at the front. They would love to pray with you, talk with you about a relationship with Jesus Christ. The pastors are gonna be out and around the Connection Center, and we would love to talk with you. Nothing would make our night better than that. At least, if you wanna to talk to someone, fill out a connection card, drop it in an offering box on your way out. We will give you a call and sit down with you and talk with you. So Jesus confessed to being king. And during the trial, this is interesting, but Pilate declared Jesus innocent and then condemned him to death. If you wanna talk about injustice, this is what Pilate did. In fact, three times, Pilate declared his belief that Jesus was not guilty of death and then had him executed, okay? In, in chapter 23, verse four, then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. And then he sent him to Herod because he found out he was from Galilee and he said, oh, that's Herod's jurisdiction. I'll pass this you know, off. Government official, I don't wanna take responsibility. So he passed him off to Herod, Herod sent him back. And, and in verse 13, it says, Pilate then called together the chief priests and rulers of the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who is misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him, and neither did Herod. I don't find him guilty of anything. And then in verse 22, he says, A third time Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done that uh, I have found in him no guilt deserving death? I will therefore punish and release him. Pilate says Jesus is innocent. And even though Pilate believed Jesus was innocent, he condemned him to death. So get this, Pilate declared his belief and then did the opposite. We're gonna talk about why in just a few minutes, but Pilate declared his belief, Jesus was innocent, and then condemned him to death. So what is a person who says one thing and does the opposite? Yeah, a hypocrite. That's a classic definition. Somebody who makes a declaration three times publicly, it's on record, and then, yeah, I'm not, I don't care. I'm gonna go ahead and compromise and I'm gonna kill somebody anyway. Pilate was hypocritical to the point of injustice. So here's a question I, I gotta ask you. Are you living the truth you believe? Are you living the truth you believe? Because just a few moments ago, just this whole room said, Jesus is Lord. So we confess Jesus is Lord, yet are we trying to follow Jesus or are we doing our own thing? And see, this is one of those questions that you and the Holy Spirit might need to wrestle with a little bit. Because we say the Bible is God's word. I mean, here at Calvary, that's part of our essential doctrines. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. So we say that we believe the Bible is God's word, but do we read it? Do we apply it to our lives? Do we ignore the parts we don't like or, you know, that make us uncomfortable because it deals with social issues that the world doesn't like us to deal with and, and doesn't want us to take a stand on? See, we say Jesus is the Savior, but do we invite our unchurched friends to church? You know, you know what's crazy is um, I've known Christians that get excited about church, get excited about Calvary and in, invite people that go to other churches. Kind of like, you should come to our church. It's better than your church. And, and, and see, that, that's not the mission that God has given us. If people are happy at their church, I always bless them and say, you should stay there and help them to grow. Help them to accomplish the mission that God has given them. What we want you to do is invite your unchurched friends to come to church with you. See, the unchurched are the people who need Jesus. If they're already, look, if they're already in the family, you're gonna hang out with them in heaven forever, Okay. So don't worry about them right now. They're good. Okay, we want to worry about the people who right now are, you know, hell is their destiny and they're the ones that are our mission. You guys get that? 
where we exist, you know, we're here to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So find your unchurched friends and annoy them about coming with you on Easter. Okay? Seriously, just, just go, hey, I want you to come. Yeah, just trust, you know, bribe them. It's fine. All right? It's good. Promise them lunch. Whatever they like. You, you can, you know, look, look, you be focused on this because if we say that Jesus is the Savior and he's the only one who can save people, then we need to act like it. You know? Do we tell people how Jesus has changed their lives? Hey, we say we love people, right? Every church I've ever been in. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself, right? Everybody. They, they put it on their walls. Love God, love people, right? Talk about that. That's probably the most popular uh, mission statement of churches all across America. Love God, love people. Great. Glad you like that. But do you know that love is patient? And love is kind? And if we're not patient and kind... Are we loving? <laughs> you guys are not enthusiastic about that one. <laughs> Some of you are like looking at your spouse going, you said you loved me. Where's the patience? Where's the kindness? It's a great question. We say we love God. We say we love people. Uh, but see, here's the thing. The power of God is revealed in us when we believe in Jesus and we live like it. And so many times, because of what we say and how we act, um, we look like Pilate instead of like Jesus. So Pilate acted opposite of his stated conviction. He sanctioned injustice, and he did that because Pilate chose to appease the crowd. Pilate chose to appease the crowd. See, just look at this. Verse, pick up at verse 18, chapter 23. But they all cried out together. This is the chief priests and the religious leaders and the crowd they'd gathered. Away with this man, Jesus, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. And uh, sounds like they're like some of the DAs that are out there now. Anyway, so Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time, Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who'd been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. So Pilate chose to appease the crowd. Now, the other Gospels reveal this even more. Matthew says a riot was just beginning. John tells us the religious leaders accused Pilate of treason. You know, Pilate was trying to release him, and, and John records the fact that there's this conversation going on where the religious leader says, you know, he claims to be a king, and if you let him go, then, you know, you're betraying Caesar, and we, you know, and... And uh, Pilate says, shall I kill your king? And they say, we have no king but Caesar. Those are the words of the religious leaders. They betrayed their nation. They betrayed their God. They betrayed Jesus. But Pilate just, he caved to, you know, political expedience. That's what he did. He chose the path of political expedience. He didn't want his superiors in Rome to think he was a weak leader. So he executed Jesus. I mean, after all, his job was to collect taxes and keep the peace. And so Pilate kept the peace. He appeased the people who were yelling the loudest. And Pilate decided to sacrifice an innocent man in order to prevent a riot. That's what he did. He looked at it and said, a riot or kill a guy I don't care about. And again, it's his responsibility to keep the peace. And Israel was a messy place. It was constantly rebelling. And he didn't want this on his record. So he decided one act of injustice to quell the crowd was worth it. And here's the thing. Pilate felt guilty about doing it. He, he felt guilty while he was doing the wrong thing, while he was committing this act of injustice. So he tries to exonerate himself. 
Gospel of Matthew tells us about how he took the wash basin out and he said, he washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Trying to say it's not my fault. In, in the Gospel of John, the, the conversation between Jesus and Pilate is Jesus goes, hey, uh, your sin is less than the people who've handed me over to you. Still sin, you're still wrong, you're still doing it, but you know, their, their, their sin is worse than yours because they know what they're doing. Um, but it's still sin. And in the end, Pilate chose to appease the crowd. And we all want to just boo Pilate, right? He's the bad guy, boo Pilate. If he was here, we walked on stage, everybody boo him. He's, well, you guys can boo now if you're, yeah, if you do that, then it feels like you're booing me. I don't, I'm not in favor. <laughs> See, it's so easy for us to condemn Pilate. We're looking at this from, the, from hindsight, and we see what he's doing. Uh, by the way, we see, you know, public officials do this all the time. To save their own neck, to save their own skin, they'll throw someone under the bus. Usually doesn't mean that they end up dying, but probably sometimes it does. So it's easy to condemn Pilate. But the question is, who are you trying to please? Who are you trying to please with your life? And, and, I, and again, I, I want to come back to that and say, this is one that, that you and the Holy Spirit need to wrestle with this week. Uh, obviously, it's, it's part of your conversation, your life groups. But, but this is a, a question that I want everyone to wrestle with. Because, it, you know, we're supposed to be trying to please Jesus. Okay, we confessed him as Lord. We said he's our king. So are we trying to please our Savior? Are we seeking to live a life of obedience? Are we pursuing our relationship actively with the King of kings and Lord of lords that we profess? Or do the crowds influence your life more than Jesus? When I say the crowds, it might be uh, politics. It might be, uh, you know, social media. It might be what's popular uh, and out there. Yeah, but is it easier for you just to go along, not cause any waves? I mean, after all, we don't want to make anyone angry. In this culture nowadays, you might get canceled. <laughs> Pretty much counting on that. Uh, but I mean, we do that. I mean, and it might be, you know, this nameless group of this mobs that, you know, like, hey, this is the politics. This is the way I got to lean. This is what I got to do. This is what I'm supposed to say. It might be that, that social media and stuff. And I just want to be popular like everyone else. And it might just be your friend group that you hang out with. And, and you feel that pressure to conform, that pressure to please them, whether they've ever asked for it or not. See, we have to wrestle with this. Who are we trying to please? Uh, is it the crowds? Or is it Jesus who influences us more? Or does your family influence your life more than Jesus? Uh, I, I mean, are, are you still living to try and please your parents? Which might be weird because some of your parents are deceased and they're not here, but uh, you still hear their voices in your head. Can't get, you can't ever get rid of that. Some of you younger ones, are, are you still trying to live to please your parents? Because you're still hoping they'll include you in the will again? Uh, are you trying to please your spouse? There's a lot of spouses who would like you to try and please them. But, but is that whose approval you're living for? Or, or what about your children? Like, well, I gotta, gotta suck up to my children because they have my grandkids and I wanna see them. See, there's a lot of danger in something that's really good because God wants us to have healthy family relationships. He wants husbands to serve wives and wives to serve husbands. And he wants us to, to bless our children and our grandchildren. And he wants us to honor our parents. He tells us one of the commandments to honor your father and your mother. All of that is important. Uh, the relationships are important. But who sways your decisions more, your family or Jesus? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go here. Um, so many times... We're confronted with decisions about how we're going to spend our time with our kids. And so many times it's easy to put a device in their hands so they don't bother you. So many times it's easy to just overschedule their life and have them in everything and every activity. And those activities are important, but then they take more, they take precedence over worship. 
They take precedence over serving. They take precedence over camps and mission trips. And, and, I, and time after time, I hear us justify that and say, well, but it's really good for them. They really like that. And, and, and we invest so much in making sure that we try to get the approval of somebody else. But is it the living God whom we serve with our lives? Who influences your life more, your family or Jesus? You see, they're just, they're voices trying to influence us constantly. And it might be friends and loved ones, or it might be TikTok. It might be the news, whichever one you watch. Uh, and even the church. By the way, I'm trying to influence you right now, in case you weren't aware of that. Uh, but which voice are you choosing to follow? And this is a significant question because if Jesus is your king, the voice, his voice is the one that we're committed to following. He's the one that we're trying to please. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he wrote this incredibly challenging statement in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, he says, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is an apostle saying this. Hey, who am I trying to please? If I'm trying to please people, I'm no longer worthy of Christ. I'm not being his servant if I'm focused on making people happy. And, and, and look, all of us have to struggle with this because if Jesus is our king, we're attempting to live what we confess, then live your life to please God. In other words, if Jesus is your king and you don't want to be a hypocrite, then put God at the forefront of your decision-making and your influence for your life. Uh, if you do that, you're going to find more contentment. You're going to find more joy. You're going to find purpose in your life, and your life will have clarity in it. Crystal clear in terms of decisions. To choose otherwise, honestly, is to take the path of Pilate because you'll end up betraying yourself and hurting others. Let me say that again. To do otherwise than to seek Jesus and to please Jesus, you're gonna take the path of Pilate and you're gonna betray yourself and you're gonna hurt other people. That's his, that's, that's what he did, right? He sold himself out. He's innocent, he's not worthy of death, but let's kill him anyway. He didn't listen to his wife who said, have nothing to do with this man. And then he hurt a lot of people. By the way, choosing to please Jesus isn't easy. The world and sometimes other Christians are gonna accuse us, call us names, slander our character. They're gonna treat us just like they treated Jesus. But choosing to please Jesus is the only path to victory and peace. I mean, that's it. So today, my prayer is that you confess Jesus as Lord, as your King, that you live your beliefs, and you choose to please your Savior. Let's pray. Father, um, we can't hide from you. We can't hide our heart. We can't hide our motives. We can't hide the truth. Uh, and while we may fool each other, um, we can never fool you. And right now, I just trust that the Holy Spirit is moving uh, in truth and in conviction and in comfort and in challenging us how we live. And God, we don't want to be pretenders. We definitely don't want to be like Pilate. We don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to be wishy-washy and listen to these people sometimes and you sometimes. We really want to live out the reality that you are our king because you are our savior. You're the one who's forgiven our sins. You're the one who has established us as the people of God. You're the one who's guaranteeing us heaven. And so we want to honor you with our lives. So God, my prayer right now is that we would hear your voice. Whether it is a voice of correction or the voice of affirmation, let us hear your voice and God, let us continue to listen to you and to your voice every single day forward. We can't do that without your help, so we surrender again, asking that you would guide us 
and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus was sinless, wrongly accused, arrested, and put on trial. Even though Pilate and Herod both found him innocent, the people demanded he be put to death, so Pilate sentences Jesus to be crucified. We're going to hear more about the crucifixion of Jesus next week, but don't despair because Easter is coming, and that's when we celebrate Christ's resurrection from the grave. We serve a living God. Thanks for listening today. I hope you join us again next week. Bye-bye. I'm Pastor Zach Papuga from Calvary, Phoenix, and I want to invite you to this year's Zona Men's Retreat. The goal and the purpose of this retreat is to get guys from all ages and all walks of life together to have an intentional time to talk about what it means to be a man of God in today's world. This year's theme will be the King's Men. We're going to take a deep dive into David's mighty men together. And that will be led by lead pastor Chad Garrison of Calvary Baptist Lake Havasu. So we want to invite all of you men to join us April 26th through 28th up at Young Life's Lost Canyon Camp in Williams, Arizona. At the camp, there are tons of activities and opportunities for you and the guys to connect and have tons of fun. The cost for this amazing retreat is $190, and that includes your meals, the content, all the activities, and your lodging for the whole weekend. You can register today for this incredible retreat at azmn.org slash men. If you register before April 1st, you can get one of these incredible King's Men shirt to wear up at the retreat. So men, we hope to see you April 26th up at Lost Canyon. Don't miss it.